my name's Aaron. Um, I uh, live in David City, Nebraska. It's a really, really tiny or small town, about 2,900 people. Um, grew up here and I uh, run a uh, Ace Hardware store here and uh, uh, got a beautiful wife, Melissa, uh, works with me also. We have two daughters. Um, hobbies, I don't know, I'm a big, big uh, vinyl record collector. Um, otherwise, uh, work. I work a lot. I love my work, love my work. And, uh, you know, before, before I had cancer, I was involved in a lot of committees and boards and things like that here. And my mindset really changed afterwards. I, uh, now if it doesn't involve my family or work, I don't really have time for it. And, and so, um, that's pretty much, you know, my other hobby is just spending time with my wife and kids and, and, and just enjoying uh, our time here. My uh, back hurt and it, uh, I just, you know, originally I just thought I'm getting old. I'm 43, you know, I, I, uh, your back starts hurting, right? And, and then it got worse, progressively worse. And uh, to the point I was walking around with a cane bent over. You know, I, I mean, I, uh, it, it, I'm stubborn. It didn't stop me from doing anything, but, but I was moving really slow and in a lot, a lot of pain. And finally my wife, uh, was like, you know, you need to go to the doctor. And I, uh, put that off and put that off. And then one morning I, uh, was getting dressed for work and of all things I sneezed and I just collapsed to the floor. My back gave out completely. I couldn't get up off the floor. And so I, I hollered for Melissa and she came running and helped me kind of get on the bed. And I laid there for a while, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, you know, and, and tried standing up again, because what do you do? Right. And, and it felt like I had my strength back. I felt like I could, you know, I was okay. It was just a whatever happened, you know, but uh, I got to, I went to work and I sat down in my chair, started doing work, whatever, 15, 20 minutes went by, and I tried to get out of the chair, and I couldn't. I had, I couldn't put any, anything on my feet, uh, you know, I could not, I had nothing, and so I called Melissa, um, she uh, either hadn't gone to work yet, or had the day off, or something, she came and picked me up, they had to, it had to look comical, they wheeled me out of the office to her car in my office chair because I couldn't walk and uh, got me in her car. We went to the doctor and uh, my primary wasn't available. So we just saw, you know, the first guy we could. He did an x-ray on my back and which was excruciating. I mean, I remember having to get on that table and oh God, I, you know, I was like, there's something wrong with me. He did some x-rays, kind of looked at me and said, nothing's wrong you know, gave me some muscle relaxers, uh, you know, it's probably a strain or a whatever and sent me on my way. So that was, that was my first uh, experience. After that, you know, the pain didn't go away. I was taking handfuls of a leave for it. And uh, I would later find out that was like the worst thing for my failing kidneys is a leave. It's terrible. Uh, you, you're, you can't take it with, with kidney problems. So I was, I was not doing myself any favors there, but I didn't know there was anything wrong with my kidneys, you know? So I went to, I went to Dr. Darrow and my primary and, uh, he, um, sent me to physical therapy. Uh, I, I kept going to see him because physical therapy did nothing. We tried dry needling that didn't do anything. Um, we did, uh, he sent me to a chiropractor and I went to the chiropractor about three times. And the third time I went in, I was just, I mean, I was, like I said, could hardly walk. I, I looked like a skeleton, like a ghost or something. And the chiropractor, God bless him. He said, I'm not going to touch you. You are in too much pain. You know, he's, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt you. And he said, he was the one that said, you should go tell your doctor you need an MRI and have him really push for an MRI. And I said, okay. So I got out to the car and called the clinic and said, I'm coming in right now. I want to see my primary. I need an MRI and went and saw him and he agreed at this point. And uh, so it took a day or two to get the MRI approved by the insurance company and everything. Um, we had to drive to Lincoln about an hour away for the MRI. Um, and I got that. And 
next day, my doctor called and said, listen, you know, there's something here. I want you to come in tomorrow and and we'll talk about it. OK, you know, ominous, obviously. But I thought like I have a slipped disc or, or ruptured something. I'm in my br brain. I'm headed for back surgery is what I think. Right. And then I go in and Melissa, my wife, came with me and he was just like, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, you've got cancer. It's uh, probably multiple myeloma or possibly lymphoma. But um, and and uh, he's let me know I had six. I had six uh, compression fractures in my spine. That's what I was walking around with. And uh, then he left us, you know, for a moment. He said, I'm going to, you know, give you a minute or whatever. And Melissa and I just kind of collapsed into each other. And, uh, you know, it was big, teary uh, hug and everything. And then I remember she took me by my face and just said, you know, we're going to beat this. And, uh, you know, we cried some more. And, whatever and we had to tell my parents uh we live not far from my folks so we told them in person and that was you know very difficult for them uh they had had a very close friend uh lose a battle with cancer about six months earlier and so it was it was really very emotional for them and uh, about two days i would say a day or two later you know i had my first oncology appointment and then we were off and running my uh, oncologist, Dr. Reno, he uh, confirmed it was multiple myeloma. Um, he sat and talked to us for quite a while. He's he's a very nice guy. He was very, you know, uh, down to earth and explained everything in English to us, you know. And and he said, you know, the end, the end of this journey is going to be a stem cell transplant. And uh, which, you know, I didn't know what that meant really either or anything. You don't know what any of this means. And and that first day, I had to get a, a bone marrow biopsy, um, which I'm sure anybody watching this will know is painful. Um, he had to do a manual one where they don't use the drill. They actually, like, just shove the needle in your back and then shove this, like, syringe kind of gimmick in there. And I was bent over the table. Somehow we got through that night, and uh, then it was, you know, the next day or the next couple of days where we kind of started letting people know and whatever, you know, what was going on, but it, uh, yeah, it was something I was stage three, which is with my multiple myeloma is the worst. I mean, there's no, I don't believe there is a stage four, it's stage one, two, three. And I had, uh, my bone marrow was 80%, uh, affected or whatever myeloma. And so I was in bad shape. Uh, I mean, and they, yeah, they suspected I'd had it for quite a while. In fact, about a year prior to me having the back problems, I uh, either broke or cracked a rib. I I don't know exactly which because they uh, when I went in for it, my doctor was like, there's no point x-ray in because there's no treatment for it. It's either broken or cracked, you know, and so well, you just, just got to heal. But I broke it like just coughing and and they suspect, you know, I, that was probably, you know, the myeloma also. Um, but there was, you know, all the back pain, the six fractures, there was no incident. You know, I never fell. I never, uh, lifted something I shouldn't, there was nothing that should have caused them, you know? So it, uh, it was all quite enlightening, quite shocking, you know? Uh, oral chemo was first. And that was, I don't know, six weeks or maybe something like that. Um, I hated that. Wasn't With that 13 chemo pills? Yeah, it was 13 chemo pills at a time I had to shove down my throat and I hated it. I mean, it, uh, I would, I would sit them on the table and stare at them mm -hmm. and I'm like, I hate this, you know, even though they're my ally, they're my weapon. I just, uh, the idea of, of shoving them down my throat and the oral chemo, I did not tolerate well. Um, it really, uh, I had a lot of throwing up from that I, or in nausea and whatever. I did not tolerate the, the oral chemo real well, but that was the first, uh, first, you know, thing. And then it led to infusions, you know, several weeks down the line. So I start the chemo and I did the dumbest thing possible. My, our, our oldest, uh, Ainsley, 
turned 13 and I had gotten her concert tickets in Kansas City for her birthday, her favorite band on her birthday. And we were going to go and stay in a hotel and all that stuff. And then like two days before it, I get diagnosed with cancer and I, you know, whatever. But I was like, I'm not ruining her 13th birthday. It's not going to be about cancer. So we went, I drove her there, you know, it's about five hours away. We drove there. I'm got my cane just stumbling along and, and uh, we went to the concert and went to the hotel and had pizza afterwards and come back and came out of it unscathed. I mean, thank God. I was freaking out the whole way that I'm going to be with my kid in Kansas City and my back's going to go out or I'm going to, you know, whatever, get sick and made it through it. But I just, you know, I couldn't, I, my kids are everything, you know, I couldn't let her down. And I, did, I wasn't going to tell her I was sick yet because I wasn't going to make her 13th birthday be about dad having cancer, you know, for the rest of her life. So, um, but then, yes, I, I'm doing the oral chemo. And then I very quickly, like maybe after two weeks, got double pneumonia. And uh, yeah, I, I was sitting on the couch and Melissa was working that day. And Addison, our youngest, was at my mom and dad's. Uh, they were watching her because I was still, you know, I was laid out. I couldn't, she was two at the time. And I really couldn't hardly breathe at that point. And she's like, I'm going to take you to the emergency room. Well, I got up and started walking and I just, I had no breath. I, I collapsed. I couldn't get out of the house. So she called 911. Um, we live in a small enough town that everybody knows where everybody lives and everybody knows me. So I think the entire volunteer fire department showed up at our house to, to wheel me off. But they took me to the hospital. Um, they run some tests and whatever. I don't know what they did. I was out of it. And they basically said, we can't do anything for you. We're shipping you off to Omaha. So they shipped me off to the hospital in Omaha. Um, and I was told later, you know, they didn't think they were going to see me again, uh, which is, you know, quite a thing to hear. But uh, I was in Omaha for what, five or six days. Um, I was in ICU for like three or four of them, which was miserable because they were, they were, they were full. So they never, they never real room to move me to, but they, uh, you know, got over the, I got over the pneumonia. Uh, that was where we found out my kidneys were failing too, was uh, then. And so they uh, started treating that, um, a lot of fluids and whatever. And after five or six days, they sent me home, uh, thank God, but um and uh, yeah, it was quite a trip. And that was when I learned, you know, hey, you got to take this seriously, kind of like my 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 mindset had kind of been like, I'm not going to let this stop me from doing anything, you know. And then I learned, OK, I can get sick and die real easy. So I, I do need to, you know, pay attention to what I'm doing. I, I tolerated the infusions pretty well. Uh, the, the chemo they were giving me causes allergic reactions. And so they gave me a script for like uh, Allegra or something, I don't know, some anti-allergy uh, medicine. And they said, you have to take this before your first chemo. And, and then everyone after that, oh, okay, okay. Well, I forgot to take it, but I didn't want to tell them that because I wanted to get the chemo on the ball. I wanted to get rolling and, and I didn't want them to delay it a day even, you know? So I was just, they were like, did you take your pre-meds? Oh yeah, sure, sure, you know? So I, the first infusion takes like eight or nine hours because they do it really slow because they want to see how you tolerate it. Well, probably, I don't know, at least halfway through it, I had allergic reaction like crazy. Like my lungs, I, I can't breathe. And, and it, I mean, I could breathe, but it was bad. It was like the worst allergy attack you ever had. And they're like, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I never told them because I didn't want them to stop. I wanted to get through that chemo and get this moving, you know, which is, again, is reckless and dumb, I suppose. But I made it through. So I told my wife about it. She thought I was pretty stupid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, uh, I'm stubborn. I wanted to, you know, I wanted, we're going to fight this. Let's start, you know, let's get it going. The, uh, but yeah, the infusions I tolerated well. You know, I'd miss a day of work and I'd come back the next day. Um, a lot of times I'd go home early because it would really wipe me out, kind of tired, you know, but I never had really any like stomach problems or anything with it like that. You know, lucky me. I mean, it uh, um, it was boring more than anything else because you sit there in the chair for four or five hours and you can only read so much. You can only play on your phone so much. You can only nap so much. So, I mean, I'm not... 
telling you anything, you know, anybody watching this doesn't know. So it's, it, uh, but it, um, it was definitely an improvement over the oral for me. So, I mean, yeah, the oral, I mean, I don't want to, I don't know how far down this road you want to go or anything, but I would, I would stay up late and take the pills because they would take me all night. I'd be fighting myself to take these pills. It might be 11 o'clock when I take them or whatever. And I would smoke some marijuana and watch the late night, uh, the West Coast NBA game. And I became a big NBA fan while I had cancer because I watched a lot of basketball. But it, uh, you know, we're we're not a state where it's legal. So it, you know, we got it from a neighboring state. And, uh, but I'm 100%, I mean, in, in terms of support of that, it's just, it works, is, is all I can tell you. And, and I have a story from, you know, later when we get into the stem cell transplant, it works. I mean, I believe that 100% that was the the biggest thing that that helped with that and uh as far as the infusions i didn't really like i said it, it made me tired but otherwise i didn't really you know have a problem tolerating it dexamethasone is a nightmare and and that was I, I was on that also and i mean 40 milligrams at one shot is a lot and i would be bouncing off the walls and i would be very irritable agitated and I couldn't sleep at night, you know, I'd be up till three, four in the morning. Um, and then I would crash, you know, the next day, day and a half later, I would be dead to the world, useless, just worthless. And, and uh, yeah, that DEX is a nightmare. I mean, it does the job. It's, it's a big part of fighting multiple myeloma, but man, it's a, it sucks. Well, like I said, I had, I had months of infusions and the, I did a bone marrow biopsy. I wrote this down. I had a biopsy in... Let's see here. I had one in May because originally we were hoping for like a May transplant and uh, my cancer hadn't, uh, the number hadn't gone down enough was what it had gone from 80 to 25, but we had to be, you have to be below five to do the transplant. And so that was kind of a bummer because I was like, you know, we were kind of ready for this. And then I get the call that, you know, we're going to have to do some more chemo. Um, so then there was more chemo somewhere along the way. Uh, I met my, the, my, 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 somewhere along the way, I met my myeloma specialist, uh, Dr. Bolshevik in, in April. And, uh, he was a saint and we were very blessed that just an hour away was a pretty, uh, you know, to have a specialist like that in my cancer was a blessing. And, uh, uh, because uh, because of insurance reasons, I had to get the transplant at a different medical system through a different hospital system than my oncologist. And so it was I kind of got handed off midstream, which was fine. I mean, it was whatever. But uh, I remember they gave me the binder for the transplant. And it's like, you know, and they sent me a, a bunch of YouTube links and they said, watch this. This is exactly how it goes. What? you go through and i i sat and watched that and i was i was in tears i mean i was floodgates of tears and i was like i can't do this it's gonna be too hard i just can't do it and i remember i sent it to my folks and my mom just was like devastated by watching what i was going to go through and everything and i uh i really you know my wife would tell you i was adamant i i, I can't go through with this but of course you know pick myself up and and realize this is the only way to keep living, you know, or the best way to keep living. And so, we, you know, we got to it eventually. And, and just the idea of the harvesting really freaked me out when I first saw and heard about that. It just seems so scary. Like, they're going to do what? You know, and, and uh, just the fact that, you know, they said you'll be in the hospital for three weeks or more, and it'll be isolated, you know, and this was pre-pandemic. So, you know, we weren't wearing masks or anything. Nobody was, you know, maybe after pandemic, that wouldn't have seemed as daunting. But, you know, it was like, I'm going to be in a hospital room, essentially alone for three weeks or whatever. And it was just, it was, it was very overwhelming. And I was, you know, my psyche was pretty fragile at that point anyway. And so uh, it really broke me down. But um, thankfully, like I said, our, uh, my myeloma specialist was just awesome. The first time I met Dr. Bolshevik, the myeloma specialist, you know, he's talking to me and I'm asking him the, you know, 
what's the percentages and all this stuff, you know, and he's being very honest with me, but he said, you know, you're in good shape. We should, you know, you should get through this and hopefully we'll defeat the myeloma and whatever. And I just told him, I said, man, I got two girls. I, I can't go now. You know, I have to get through this. And he just, you know, put his hand on my shoulder and, and said, you will, you know, we'll, we will get you through this. It, uh, you know, it's just, I just, I remember that first appointment. It was very emotional because it was, you know, um, I was just so frightened to leave my girls without a dad, you know, and my wife alone too, you know, I, I, they're, the kids were 13 and two, they need a dad, you know, and, uh, and, and God bless my wife. I just, I didn't want to leave her alone to have to do that, you know, and it, uh, that, that was my big driving force was, was my family. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, they were incredibly supportive, uh, Ainsley, our, our 13 or well, 18 year old, whatever, she was 13 at the time. You know, she had a really hard time with it. Um, she had to, you know, she had some kind of breakdowns and, and, you know, but she talked to somebody, you know, had had some help and, and got through it. And I, I remember telling her, you know, all I need from you is to just keep doing well in school, keep doing your homework, keep going to class. The last thing I need is to have to worry about you you know, failing school or having problems or whatever. And, and she kept her end up. And like I said, she's an honor student now. She's got a full ride to Nebraska. So, uh, you know, she's amazing. They take a, maybe a week or so before the transplant. The, this is after all the chemo infusions, all the kind of normal stuff. Uh, they harvest your stem cells. And I had to go in, I think the day before or something like that and get a shot that basically is supposed to like jumpstart their productivity or whatever. And so th then I came in, I remember I had to be there super early in the morning, like 5 a.m. or something like that. My dad took me and God bless my dad. Leave this in here, please. My dad took me to every single chemo, every doctor's appointment, every everything. Um, my wife, yeah, she was working full time. We had to be there two days in a row at, like I said, 5 a.m. or something, or maybe 6, I don't know. And they hooked you up to this thing. I had a port in at that time. And they hook you up to this big washing machine kind of thing, looking thing. And you sit there in the chair for, I forget what it was, several hours while they take out your um, uh, stem cells, your blood, take whatever. They clean them up. You know, they harvest them. And then they're going to put them back in you after they have clean the bad stuff out um so i do that twice it, you know it didn't hurt or anything it was just very daunting it was you know what a strange you know you're sitting there like where what is my life you know this is so weird and uh they uh uh what's it going to say they were able to harvest enough for two transplants so if down the road um you know how this disease is i mean i may face that again and and so that's there which is nice to know uh, um and then a week or so later was the uh, transplant itself. So we went to Omaha. We have the uh, Buffett Cancer Center in Omaha, which is an amazing facility. And uh, checked in the day before the transplant. Um, immediately sit you in a room and hook you up to the chemo. And uh, that's the, you know, hair falls out, makes you really sick, kills everything inside chemo, you know. And... Uh, that was weird. I remember because it took 45 minutes or an hour or something like that. And Melissa and I were just alone in the room the whole time. And so we just talked and whatever, you know, and then you uh, we went to our room and, you know, had nice, big, clean, beautiful room. Everything sanitized, of course, but, you know, big TV. Uh, they told you, bring whatever you want from home because you're going to be here. So, you know, brought a bunch of pictures and some little good luck charms, tchotchkes, whatever. And, uh, and, uh, this quilt that people had made for me and, um, you know, basically just checked in and, uh, then I, you know, it's constant blood draws and constant checking this and checking that. And this second day there, they do the transplant, which, you know, I remember when I first heard transplant, it sounds crazy, you know, where they cut me open, where they do, you know, what they stick an IV in you, you know, or I think it was through my port even, it wasn't an IV, you know, and it takes like 45 minutes, they bring your stem cells in and they're frozen in uh, this 
thing and they pull out this little bag full of red stuff and that's your stem cells you know it's crazy and they're pointing out or it's your your blood whatever they're pointing out to us they're like see those little flecks in there that's your stem cells and it's like wow you know that's so crazy so they uh we did that like i said maybe it was 45 minutes something like that and then it was back to just laying down or whatever and it was probably i don't know a day later when i got really sick I would say probably, 20, you know, within 24 hours, I was in really rough shape. So I got really sick, really sick and couldn't eat anything, couldn't hold anything down, um, couldn't get out of bed. I'm as weak as weak can be. Um, they tried, you know, everything they try, you know, to to make you not as sick. Uh, they finally were discussing with my wife, putting a feeding tube in because um, I was and I was out of it basically i mean i was conscious i suppose but i was so weak i mean it was and they said well there's one more thing we can try it's called marinol and that's a it's a synthetic thc and they gave me that it worked so fast and so effectively um that you know by the next day i was kind of back to normal or over the sickness at least you know you were keeping things down. yeah i was able to keep things down finally and uh, so that was, you know, I said, I have to do this again. I'm going to tell them to start with that. <laughs> but uh, it uh, uh, so then you're there, you know, for three weeks or so and um, constant, you know, blood draws and injections and checking your this, that and the other thing. And um, extremely weak, like I said, uh, probably the second or third day there you know all the hair started coming out uh i had i had gotten a buzz cut going in because i knew you know i should have had him shave it all though because with the buzz cut all i was getting was a bed full of tiny little hairs everywhere all over the pillow all over the bed you know i i just go like this and it just come flying off my head and um and you know what i didn't know too people will you know you think about your hair falling out but your hair falls out everywhere you know, you're, I mean, I was, my entire body was bald as a baby's butt. It was crazy, you know. Uh, but, uh, so let's see, we're there. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, I'm, I'm eating and I'm, I'm feeling, you know, better. Still the weakest I've ever felt in my life, but, but better. Uh, uh, vitals and everything are good. You know, white blood count. Um, is starting to regenerate slowly, you know, to where they felt like they could release me. And so that was a good day. And, uh, um, but God bless everybody at the Buffett Cancer Center, man, floor seven, they're uh, unbelievable care. I mean, wow. Um, and, and I remember, you know, talking about being weak, they would say, go walk, walk all you can walk, you know, and just a lap around that floor, and I just could hardly, I'd be practically, you know, being carried by Melissa by the time we get back to the room. So I was so weak, so weak. And, uh, uh, but they let us out and then we had to stay close. So they want you to stay close for five days afterwards to just keep an eye on you. And I think I had to go in each of those days, you know, just for them to do test whatever. And uh, so we stayed at the Hope Lodge in Omaha, which is, you know, they're amazing. Hope Lodge is just an incredible uh, organization or whatever you want to call it, facility and everything. And um, we were there for five days and then they let us go home. And uh, then it was, you know, a little while longer of just laying on the couch and not really, you know, doing a whole lot. So then uh, come December, we had a hundred day follow-up following the transplant and that's when you find out did all this trouble you know work and I was man I'd never been so anxious and scared and everything else and we went in and and uh, we're sitting there in the room Melissa and I and we're sitting there for what felt like an eternity and uh, Jennifer came in and She's like, how are you guys? You know, whatever. It's it's December 20th. So five days before Christmas. So this is going to make or break Christmas, you know. And and uh, I, don't, I don't remember what she said. Something like, you know, you look scared or you look anxious or something. I'm like, duh, you know. And she's like, listen, it's good news. And I was just like, the weight of the world was just, you know. 
and, and then Dr. Bolshevik came in and, and went over it. And it was pretty much CR, you know, pretty much complete remission. There was a little bit of something in my urine they were seeing. And he said, a year from now, we're not going to see that. He said, it's, you know, you're basically 98%. And uh, and you're going to be 100 percent. And I was just like, wow, you know, and I remember we left that room and we stopped in the hall. My wife and I, we kissed for the longest time. We were both crying and holding each other just in the hallway. It was so emotional. And, uh, you know, we went out to dinner that day then or to lunch in Omaha. I had a celebration and um, it was a, it was a magical Christmas. I mean, it really was, you know, for everybody, for my family, for my folks, my brother and sister, you know, everybody had stressed in this for basically a calendar year, you know, it was January to December and, uh, it was just, you know, a miracle happened. It was, it was incredible. I feel like I, I'm a completely, you know, I'm a, I'm a different person. Um, like I said, if it doesn't involve my family or work, I just don't really care. I don't have time for it, you know, and, uh, we uh we like to travel you know we've been doing things and and uh watching our kids grow up and and that's what's important to me now you know there's my brain is so far less distracted than it used to be and and melissa and i i mean our marriage got so much stronger through all this and, and since i mean what do you you know you get married and you say uh in sickness and in health and you don't know what that means until something like this happens, you know? And uh, uh, my life is great now, it, it is. My wife is incredible. My kids are incredible. My work is incredible. I think it, 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 some maturity happened through this and, and just, you just get a different sense of what's important and what, it, you know, you realize the things that you're gonna miss if you go. You know, the things you're going to leave behind. And those are the things that, that's all that matters to me now, are those things, you know? And because, like I said, it's my multiple myeloma is a lifetime thing. And I don't know when, I'm lucky, I'm four and a half years almost in remission. And uh, that could, I have an appointment next month, and that could be the end of it for all I know, you know? But it, uh, we're going to live while things are, you know, uh, in remission. And uh, we have a lot of fun. So I just try to, you know, make our life as good as we can because that's she deserves it and, and we deserve it. And um, yeah, we, you know, we have a lot of fun. <laughs>